Um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. This is very loud. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have a, a, a speaker here today that um, say a few words to you. She's got a book that she's going to talk to you about for a few minutes. And uh, she's a neuroblastoma mom, uh, currently from Ohio. She moves around a little bit here. Uh, and it's Rachel Ormsby. Yep. Good morning, I hope you all have your coffee. I get mine after I'm done. Um, my son Nathan was diagnosed August 8th of 06, uh, stage four high-risk neuroblastoma, unfavorable everything. Um, and we started treatment in Dayton, Ohio. We were lucky enough at that point to find some families who knew everything there was about neuroblastoma and let us know about it all in one day. Um, and we, of course, didn't absorb any of it. So <laughs> through the following years, Nathan is still on treatment now, just to give you an idea of where he is. But through those following years, we pretty much saw every treatment there was out there. We saw every scan. And he failed them all. He did not do well in frontline therapy. He did not do well in MIBG therapy. He did not do well coming out of transplant. He did not do well out of 3F8. So we ended up seeing everything. Well, he's 11 and awesome and doing great and still on treatment and wonderful and fantastic. Um, so what we did, um, we realized that out in the world of neuroblastoma, especially with Pat's help, there's a lot of information. There's a lot out there. You can go to their handbook and get 100% of the information available for neuroblastoma. That doesn't really help new families as they start. So we took our experience of all these treatments that we went through and we put together the 1% primer. This is the book that we hope families get when they get diagnosed. So it has all the treatments we went through, it had all the scans we went through, it introduces all those terminologies, it explains everything that we have learned. So the book is written that if I could sit down with you and I had 200 pages to explain what we had learned, that's what's in this book. It tells you about all the late effects we've encountered, uh, Nathan started in remedial math, remedial reading, remedial everything. He is now a straight A student at grade level. And it's all the things we learned through that process in this book. It is yours for free. They are out front. Please take them. Take them back to your hospital. Give them away. The um, they will always be free. It's our gift. There's no way I could take money from you since you're the ones we want to give the information to. So um, we are always collecting donations, but that's for your healthy friends, not for you. Um, our contacts on the back, but the books are yours. Take as many as you want. I got about 120 of them to give away and um, give them away to other families if you have them. I hope they help a little. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I know a lot of you here, and uh, some of you are first-time uh, attendees. Uh, my name is Pat Tlungan. I'm the founder of the Children's Neuroblastoma Cancer Foundation. We started the foundation in 2000 um, after we lost our son Nick to neuroblastoma. He was 10 years old when he passed away. And we were just very committed, like all of you are, to try to find a cure, uh, try to help educate people, try to bring about awareness of the disease. Um, and we thought one of the ways that we were going to do this was through this conference. I was uh, a big person as far as education was concerned because if you're not educated and you don't know things, it becomes very difficult to make a decision as to what you need to do and what you, which way you have to go forward. So this is our 11th uh, parent education conference and hopefully we have many more to come. Um, CNCF uh, was started, like I said, we, our goal is to raise money for research and education and bring about awareness for the disease. Um, we have funded over $2 million in research so far. We're very, very proud of that. Um, like I said, this is our 11th conference. Um, we have a wonderful handbook written by parents. Um, one of our editors is here, uh, Jen Click, where are you? Uh, stand up. Um, Jen. Jen, uh, Donna Ludwinski, Shirley Staples, Antonia Palmer, and many of the neuroblastoma parents have contributed to that handbook. Uh, hopefully all of you have taken a look at it, you know, downloaded the chapters that you need. It's an excellent, excellent resource. Uh, very, very good information uh, from a parent's perspective. So it, again, talks about different things that, you know, they have gone through. So we do hope that you do take a look at it and review it. 
Um, and Shirley and Jen and Don have just done a tremendous job in editing it, and we can't thank them enough for all of their hard work and time. Um, there are a couple people, real quick, that I do want to thank um, for this conference especially, because we always have a very, very difficult time funding it. Um, and this year was like a miracle year in manna from heaven. Um, because we literally, um, Kenna Anderson, who is in charge of the kids' room, number one, I hope you all thank her and her family and friends because they do a tremendous job taking care of your children. Uh, but she and her husband made a considerable donation to make sure that this conference uh, was put on. Um, there's a gentleman in the back of the room. His name is Mike Feldman. Um, he's sitting back there doing the videotaping for us. And I wanted to acknowledge him because he donates his services every year. And he's just got a heart of gold, and I love him to death. And we have to go out to dinner one of these days so I can buy him a bottle of wine. Um, but we thank him from the bottom of our hearts for what he's done. Um, there's another group, uh, Neuroblastoma family uh, here in the Chicago area, who donated $10,000 to have this conference come on, along with the Thank Foundation out of New York. Um, and their son is a neuroblastoma survivor, and he, uh, Duke is doing very, very well, so we're very happy for that. Um, then you're going to meet somebody later on. His name is Ryan Deem. Uh, he's a former NFL football player for the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, he was a right tackle. He's from the Chicago area. Uh, he did a very passionate plea at our golf outing, and they funded $37,000. Uh, in order to have this conference put on. Otherwise, we would not be having this conference. And it was just, there was not a dry eye in the house to see this big six foot seven man crying because he had come to the conference last year and met all the children. And it just touched him so deeply that he, he just went for it. And it was, it was wonderful. So those are some people that we really need to thank, you know, for doing what they've done. A um, couple of things that, um, Oh, we also have a family down in Houston, uh, Scott and Be Becky Skazny, and we work with uh, Ryan Pickett, formerly of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, I understand they let him go. Um, but he was a defenseman, and he, he gets involved in that golf outing down in Houston, and uh, we've raised probably about $250,000 at that golf outing. So we're very thankful to the families and stuff down in the Houston area. Now, as far as instructions as to how this conference is going to work, um, our presenters are usually going to give about a 30-minute presentation, and we'll have 15 to 20-minute question and answer session afterwards. I do ask that you make your questions very general in nature um, so that everybody can benefit uh, from the question. And we're going to ask you to come up and use the microphones because we are videotaping so that we can hear the question and we can hear the answer so that when somebody is watching the video, they'll know if a certain question was answered and they can hear it. So if you could do that, we would really appreciate it. Um, I'll have a handheld, too, if you need it. Um, we ask that you don't go into the children's room to check on your children, if at all possible, um, only because it gets them crazy and, and riled up and they want to get out and no, you can't. Um, so if, if you could just leave them there, they're, they're in very, very good hands and they're going to enjoy themselves, trust me. Um, let's see, and fill out any necessary forms. We are, uh, again, videotaping here, but we also are doing personal interviews. Um, and talks at different times of the day. So if anybody is interested, please let us know. We have a room downstairs so if, you know, to be interviewed. We're hoping that one day we can use this to uh, do some PSAs, do some marketing material for neuroblastoma and for CNCF, and to tell your story. Um, because I really, truly believe that neuroblastoma isn't out there enough, and we're trying to make it a, a well-known thing out in, the, in society so that people know about it and would be willing to help us. So hopefully one day we'll get that, get that going. Um, we do have a very tight schedule. Um, Dr. Yannick isn't, isn't here, so we should be on time. So every time Dr. Yannick comes, we're talking for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. Um, and we love him, and we wish he was here. But um, we didn't invite him this time. We have to move on to others. <laughs> it's no slight against you, Dr. Yannick. Um, and like I said, we'll have a couple of guest speakers later on. We have continuous coffee in the back and water. Um, and one other thing, we are having dinner tonight um, in 
the next salon, Salon B, where we're having breakfast. So don't worry about going out. If you want to go out and have dinner, please feel free to go ahead and do so. But if you don't want to spend any money, we are having taco night. Um, so make your own tacos, and the kids will have hot dogs if they don't like tacos. Um, we'll have a DJ dancing, and we hope you all participate. We have a couple of special singers that will be there, uh, a couple of neuroblastoma uh, survivors that we, we want to uh, showcase. So, okay, I'm done. And now for our presentations. Um, our first speaker um, is Dr. Shaw, and he's a physician scientist in the Center for Childhood Cancer and Blood Diseases at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He also has a joint appointment as assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics in, um, where am I? I lost my place, in the Ohio State University College of Medicine. His research focuses on embryonic cancers, including neuroblastoma. He specifically examines how these types of childhood cancers avoided normal development and became cancers. His goal is to identify signaling pathways that promote normal differentiation in these tumors and to develop the genes involved in those pathways as biomarkers for diagnosis and treatment. Um, Dr. Shaw is a graduate of honors program in medical education at Northwestern University, earning his medical degree in 2003, completed his residency in general pediatrics in 2006 at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, and a fellowship in uh, pediatric hematology at Johns Hopkins University and the National Cancer Institute. Um, in addition to this research, he sees pediatric oncology patients through the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Dr. Shaw. Um, yes. today. Um, as a Chicagoan, let me say welcome to all of you to a lovely July in Chicago. Um, hope those of you from warmer climes are staying warm. Um, I'm a physician scientist. I spend 80% um, of my time in the lab, but um, I love seeing my patients and uh, I just want to thank all of you and, and Pat in particular for, for coming here and and uh, doing what you, uh, what you can for, uh, for all of our kids. So, um, the goal of my talk today, um, talking about improved diagnosis and treatment stratification uh, through molecular and genetic testing, is to um, really give you a, a, a better sense of, of what we're trying to do um, in, uh, in the lab. So a brief introduction to the basic cellular um, mechanisms from genes and proteins. Examples of previous projects and current projects examining each of these and then uh, current projects that we're working on at Nationwide. Um, so broad strokes, neuroblastoma, uh, we've got three large groups. You've got very low and low risk patients. These tend to be the younger patients, as you guys know. Um, and uh, generally, they, they do well. 80% um, or so are cured surgically, even if they have residual tumor, which really suggests that they're going to have really low risk disease and perhaps don't even need surgery. And that's important because up to 25% of, of patients who undergo even these surgeries have significant morbidities related to that. They can have complications, they can uh, unfortunately lose kidneys, um, and, and some patients even uh, die unfortunately from that. So um, if we can get a better sense of, of um, how many of these patients we can just watch better, that would really help. Uh, but even in that low risk group, about 20% will have their disease come back would probably benefit from having chemotherapy earlier. So we need a better way of, of sorting that out. Uh, then we've got a, a small percentage of patients who are intermediate risk. Those are the kids that we know that their disease is probably a little bit more aggressive. Let's go ahead and give them chemotherapy um, uh, right after surgery. And uh, they also do uh, exceedingly well. Uh, and then we have the, the high risk patients. Um, and uh, we frankly are, are still struggling with the clinical challenges there. Um, we have a group of patients who are responsive to the current treatments, or long-term survivors, and, uh, and, and we'll be very happy to, to see um, their stories um, here this weekend. Uh, but we have a significant portion, over 50% of the patients who are resistant to current treatments. And they break out to two groups. Some patients just never respond to treatment. They just basically are always growing their tumor, and, and we're looking for uh, newer and better ways to treat them. Uh, and some patients will, will go through treatment, they'll have a good response, and they'll have recurrence at some point. 
So what we're really trying to do uh, through these expression analyses is one, try to find a better prognostic biomarker to say, which of these patients can we observe safely? And which of all of these patients should really be getting chemotherapy right away, should really be in the, in the intermediate risk group? And uh, the other thing we're looking for is um, a biomarker of response, something that's gonna tell us, okay, either early in treatment or you know, ideally before treatment starts, but at least early in treatment, what's a way that we can tell this kid is responding before we see a tumor explode? So if we know that they're gonna not really benefit from the treatments that we're giving them now, we can move, roll them on to newer treatments and to, and to some of the um, newer studies. So what is expression? I like to think of this as the human restaurant. So we've all heard of DNA. DNA is where all of our genes are. It's the, the blueprint to the body is uh, usually the metaphor it's given. DNA becomes RNA, or specifically mRNA. So that's the code that each cell takes from just the genes that each cell needs specifically to then make the proteins that that specific cell needs to, to do all the functions that it needs to do. So for example, a brain cell doesn't need all the same proteins that a liver cell does or that a blood cell does but they all have the same general DNA. So how do you sort that out? So the, the way that works is, think of DNA as a menu. You're at the human restaurant, the DNA is the menu. It's the fullest of everything. You're not gonna order everything. So whenever you order, you're, that's your mRNA, that's your order ticket. That's just what you need right there for that cell, for that, that uh, order for dinner. And then they take that order back into the kitchen and then you get your food out. So, Different things can go wrong at different points. For DNA, uh, you can have errors in DNA called mutations. And Dr. Spinto and Yamashiro are gonna talk about this more tomorrow, but just as an idea, an example would be, if in, on the menu, instead of printing pizza with pepperoni, it only says pizza with anchovies. So no one knows that there should be pizza with pepperoni. And so you're never gonna get pizza with pepperoni out to your restaurant, and that can cause problems. And like I said, they're gonna talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. What we're looking at more on the expression side is looking at mRNA. So you'll hear these different terms about mRNA being overexpressed or underexpressed. When mRNA is overexpressed, you're just getting too much mRNA, you get too much of the proteins that you don't want. And in, in our circumstance, in, in neuroblastoma and cancer in general, we're talking about pro-cancer proteins, things that make the cells proliferate, things that make them resistant to the chemotherapies. So the analogy here is that, okay, you've got your order ticket and Someone places an order for 100 uh, orders of nachos. And so that's what you get, it's just all nachos. Which, an order of nachos, great. 100 orders of nachos, you're gonna feel pretty crummy at the end of it, so. In contrast, you'll hear about underexpression. And underexpression is just the opposite. Instead of having um, the right amount of mRNA for a given gene, you're, it's really <coughs> undercut. And there, it's all the, the proteins that you would want the healthy cells to have, so the cells that say, differentiate, become stable, stop proliferating. In our case with neuroblastoma, you want them to become nerve cells. And uh, they also are the proteins that regulate cell death. So if you've got too many cells, you can, you can thin the herd. You get the right number of cells. So here we're talking about you have your order ticket again, and this time no orders for salad are coming in. And so because there are no orders for salad coming in, you get no salad. And again, the cells are in a health and healthy circumstance and they can get biased back towards the nachos. Don't get me wrong, I like nachos. All right. um, and then you'll hear about other things as well where mRNA can be um, slow, uh, its process can be slowed, it can be degraded, it can be stabilized. There are lots of different ways where the amount of, of mRNA that's produced doesn't necessarily match the amount of protein that gets produced. And so the, the analogy here is that you can have a slow kitchen, you can have a slow waiter, you can have lost tickets. Orders can be answered twice, so your food doesn't always match your, your order ticket. And the reason I emphasize this is because it's important to, to study each of these different steps. So I know that was a, a quick analogy, but hopefully you'll get a, a bit, little bit better sense as you're, you're hearing about some of these different studies and what we're trying to study. Um, uh, so is this a new concept? No. We've been using protein expression for, for decades at this point. Every time that your kids get their urine checked for the urine catecholines, for HVA and VMA. These are protein products. So we, and we use that to check for the neuroblastoma. So it's, it's an idea that's been around for quite a while. We're trying to find newer and better ways to say, not just is the cancer there, but can we know more about the cancer? Is it 
going to be responsive to treatment? Is it, is it going to be something that we need to treat more aggressively? Uh, like I said, there are benefits to studying each step. So when you study DNA, DNA is very, very stable. Um, those of you who've seen Jurassic Park, be around for millions of years. Um, it's far easier to test compared to some of these other molecules we're talking about. But it's not necessarily very consistent between patients, particularly in neuroblastoma. There are some cancers where we know, okay, there's a mutation that happens every single time. But neuroblastoma doesn't necessarily happen in that same way. Making amplification is something that we do test for on a DNA level consistently, but, but even then, we're talking about a, a minority of patients who have that. RNA, on the other hand, it's going to be in a lot of the different cells. Um, it's less stable in DNA. Um, not so horribly stable, but it, or so horribly unstable that you can't study, but it takes a little bit more rigor to test it. Um, it is more stable than protein, and it reflects better of what exactly is going on in the cell at that moment. So it's really about telling you what's the signal process that's going on. And so there's some benefits there, and, we'll, and I'll show you some examples of that in a, in a minute. And protein, the, the downside of protein is very unstable. Pretty much if you take a patient's tumor sample, you need to get it frozen or preserved very, very quickly or those proteins start to break down. Um, the cells need to be fixed to so study them. They, that means that they have to be dead, so we can't really do a lot of tests on them. So we can't test them for, uh, are you going to be sensitive to chemotherapy this way or that way. Um, but a lot of pathology labs have ways to test proteins, so pathology labs like to study proteins. In a, um, you'll hear about a test called immunohistochemistry a lot of times where they'll look at slides um, looking for that protein ex explicitly. Well, again, I'll show you some examples of that. So some, some broad strokes um, examples of how we're studying these different ways. You'll hear about tests called microarrays. This is a way, it's a very high-tech way to look at hundreds to tens of thousands of genes at once. And you'll see uh, different researchers talk and they'll, they'll present pictures that look like this. Each tiny little spot represents a different gene. And generally red means it's overexpressed, there's too much of that RNA, and green means it's underexpressed and there's too little. And it's a great technology, it's a great way to, to look at the whole cell all at once. But there are limitations, it's an expensive test, there's a lot of effort that goes into just making this step. There's a lot of effort that goes into the analysis you need, really high-end mathematics called biostatistics and bioinformatics to, to get that analysis. Um, and it's something that we've been using and trying to use clinically for a while, but it's hard to get it rolled out in the same way because, again, you're testing you know, anywhere between uh, you know, hundreds to, uh, to thousands of genes, and it, it gets a little bit tricky. So, but it's a great way for us to kind of screen, to find, okay, maybe there are some genes within there that we should study a little bit more closely. So then the thought was maybe instead of looking at hundreds of genes, let's look at a, at a handful of genes. And uh, an ex uh, example of that through NANS and COG is this test called TLDA. It stands for Tachman Low Density Array. It's been developed by uh, um, our colleagues at uh, Children's Hospital of LA. Um, and there what they're looking at is expression of five genes specifically. And they say that if you can test the blood, and if you find that those five genes are being expressed, they shouldn't be. And if they're being expressed, then that probably means there are neuroblastoma cells there. And since they've demonstrated that, it can say explicitly that. You can see if there are neuroblastoma cells floating around. So you can test patients' blood or bone marrow at different points of treatment and say, okay, how much of the neuroblastoma load is still there? Problem is, we're not sure if that really means that that's going to be neuroblastoma that we can get rid of with further treatment, or is that neuroblastoma that's going to be resistant? So we're still sorting that out clinically. Um, so that's where there are ongoing trials. You'll hear, um, as, as we go further into, um, uh, into more studies in the next few years, uh, we're talking about minimal residual disease, or MRD. That's what we're talking about, where you can't see large tumors, but you can see signs that there's still some neuroblastoma lingering around. So should we continue treatment? So you'll hear about that phrase a, a bit more. Then you can look at one gene um, at a time. Uh, you may have heard about uh, the, gene, the gene ALK before, and we know that ALK mutations, that's the DNA level again, that can predispose you to having neuroblastoma. But there have been researchers in Germany and, and Belgium that have shown that even the expression level, you don't have to have a mutation in, in the DNA, you don't have to have something go wrong at the DNA level, but if you just have too much of the ALK there, that's bad. So the red curve, this is a survival curve, so <laughs> The lower it gets, the, um, the fewer patients are surviving. 
and the red curve are the patients who have ALK mutations. So they, they don't do well. About um, uh, less, uh, around 50% of them will have recurrence of their disease at some point. Um, but if you look at all the patients who don't have ALK mutations, these patients have very low ALK, and they do generally well. Over 80% of them are cured. But as you get increasing levels of expression, they do as poorly as the patients who have ALK mutations. So this is a way that we can look at expression instead of just at mutations to really say, okay, these kids are gonna have very aggressive disease. We need to be more aggressive about their treatment as a result. Um, you can look at the same thing by protein. This is what I was talking about with immunohistochemistry. That you take a slice of the tumors, you put them on a slide, and you use an antibody and try to um, basically light up what um, are the proteins that you're looking for. So this is a tumor that doesn't have any of the ALK protein, and you don't see any brown. And here you have a, protein, a, that, a different tumor from a different patient, and all the brown spots are where that ALK protein is. So instead of looking at the mRNA, you're looking at the protein level. It's another way just to say, okay, how much of that bad protein is floating around. And there's a group out of China that said that you can do this, um, a, a parallel test. And again, patients who have ALK positivity have ALK protein expression they do poorly, we need to treat them more aggressively compared to other patients. Uh, and this is yet another study that's, that's being validated by muscle groups. All right, then where are we for, we need a timer. <laughs> I unfortunately don't know where we are with time. 9.35. 9 9 okay. Um, the, this is yet another study that's being developed by Dr. Shimada um, at uh, Children's of LA. And instead of looking at just MCN, which we all know about, MCN uh, gene uh, mutations, um, he's looking at a related protein called MYC. And again, they show that if your tumor does not have MYC protein or MYCN protein, those patients do well. They're about 75% cured. If you have MYCN protein expression in your tumor, they do less well, about 50% um, survival. But if you have MYC protein expression, they do exceedingly poorly. Um, so these, again, are identifying a new set of patients that we didn't really know about before, but that we should be treating more aggressively as a result. Okay. So that, that's the different ways that we're studying the tumors um, and trying to find better markers to really identify, okay, this patient is doing poorly and, and that patient's probably going to do well. But we need to think about neuroblastoma as a developmental disease. It's really a full spectrum from the normal sympathetic nervous system to benign tumors to the low-grade, low-risk tumors that generally are going to do well to the very high-grade tumors. And the question is really, like, how are these all related to each other? What makes something that could be a low-grade tumor instead of a benign tumor? Or what makes the high-grade tumors really as aggressive as they are? Because under the slide, under the microscope, they all look the same to us, generally. So really starting out, what makes these different? And how can we make these bad tumors more like these better responding tumors or these benign tumors. So that's what I'm specifically looking at um, in, in my research. And there are uh, genes called Hox genes. And these are the master regulators of the body. They tell every organ in your body when you're supposed to develop and where you're supposed to develop. These are genes that are evolutionarily um, uh, existent. And so all the way back to fruit flies. So normally fruit flies should have one antenna and one wing on each side. If you have a mutation in those genes, you can get two wings instead of one set of wings, or you can get a leg sitting on their head instead of an antenna. And, and generally in humans, we know that those same genes have ancestors, and uh, those genes have been associated with different malformations in humans as well. And some are more severe than others, but, so, so, um, but we also know those genes are important in cancers as well. So this is a, a large table of all sorts of different types of cancers. And you'll see that neuroblastoma, that these Hox genes uh, have been shown to be important there as well. That basically you have an error in development. You have the regulation of that tumor. It's gone haywire. And that different, in different circumstances will cause the tumor to be more aggressive or less aggressive. So we're looking at those genes, again, using that, that first technology, that microarray technology, to look at all of them at once and really compare the different types of tumors. And as an example, these are benign tumors here. And these are neuroblastomic cancer cell lines. So these are cell lines that have been derived from actual cancer. So this is benign, and this is malignant. And we can basically find that there are um, over 200 different spots, 
different uh, locations within those genes at the expression level. So this is the RNA level, where the uh, malignant cells are different from the benign cells. And this is a cluster of them where the, uh, the genes that should be on have been turned off in the cancer, and the genes that should be off have been turned on in the cancer. And so this is just the first of the studies. We're now going through and looking at the different groups specifically. And we've already identified a number of candidate genes. And the goal there is to really say, okay, if we can take a set of those and at the outset say, okay, here's a set of high-risk patients, and we looked at survivors and non-survivors, and when these genes are on in the, in the high-risk patients, they're more likely to be a non-survivor. So those are the patients that we'd want to say from the get-go. You know, we want to enroll you on the ANBL12P1 or, or one of those early uh, neuroblastoma studies, but we don't think it's going to work well for you. So we want to recommend this more aggressive treatment, and this is why. And that's really the rationale of what we're, we're working on there. And as an example of that, there's a related um, gene called PBX1. And what we looked at is we looked at the expression of PBX1 in the different types of tumors. So in the benign tumors, PBX1 is very highly expressed. This is a, what we call a log scale. So this is, um, each number is tenfold higher than, uh, than the previous number. If you look at low-risk tumors, these are patients that had uh, surgical resection. They still had some tumor left behind. So they were at risk for their tumor to come back, but, they, but the tumor never did. And they had pretty high expression of this um, gene called PBX1. If you look at the patients who had lower disease and their tumors were taken out, but then it came back, they had very low expression of that PBX1. And there is no overlap between those groups. So this is potentially a test that we could say for all of our lowest patients, let's do this one extra test. And we'll really know if we can just observe you, not put your child through surgery, unless that, that you have some complication um, where, where we need to reduce the amount of tumor that's in them. And this set of patients, you're not going to behave as well. And we should be treating you more aggressively right away. We should give you surgery and chemotherapy and really get this cured right out of the gate. And so we're going to be we're, uh, validating these studies now. We're um, hoping to roll that out into a, a clinical trial in the near future. So our current goals are to validate the PBX1 expression, like I said, in lower tumors. Um, and then also see, can we turn that gene back on in high-risk disease? Can we make the the tumors behave by having more of this uh, protein? Can we understand it better? We're evaluating, as I mentioned, the different Hox genes, and again, trying to find the patients who won't respond to treatment, the current treatments, and route them to novel treatments. And we're also trying to find better ways to study it. Right now, pretty much we, we take the biopsy at diagnosis and we study that, but should we be studying it at different points? Is the tumor changing on us? So should we be checking marrow samples and looking at what's the changes in expression at the different points along treatment? Should we look at the tumor once it's resected after cycle four or five of chemotherapy? And if the patient has a relapse, should we be looking at the tumor there as well? So we're identifying different ways to, um, to better study all these different tumors. Um, just as an acknowledgement, um, I am at Nationwide Children's Hospital. I've been there uh, for a year. And, and uh, despite being a Chicagoan, I'm very happy in Columbus. I um, have to thank um, our division chief, Dr. Kripe, um, and our uh, research chief, uh, Dr. Houghton, um, and my partner, Dr. Rinaldi, who couldn't make it um, here this weekend, unfortunately, and then all the members of my lab. Um, and then uh, a lot of this help has been uh, greatly aided by the Children's Oncology Group and uh, Michael Hogarty there um, and um, these other research centers, and all of our patients and families for whom we do all of this and we get so much more in return. I hope that the talk has not left you feeling like our young lady here who is asking her scientist friend of how this time travel works, and at the end says, this is why I hate talking to geeky science boys. <laughs> um, I guess we'll do questions after my uh, colleague speaks. Uh, we're completed then? Yep. OK. Uh, does uh, anyone have any questions of Dr. Shah? Hi, I have a question. Um, the TLDA blood expressions that you talked about, yep. do you guys see that being used post-treatment and follow-up? So that's what's being evaluated currently in the studies, to really say um, once you've completed treatment for the patients who we know have complete response, have no image-based evidence of disease, can we use this test to say, okay, these are the kids who even though we can't see their tumor, they're the ones who are going to have recurrence, versus if you, it's a negative test, you're probably going to be okay. We don't know the answer to that yet, but that's what's being studied. So it would be great to have an uh, opportunity just to give your kid a blood test and not have to go through scans or... 
the next 10 years? <laughs> Obviously. Don't predict it replacing the scans anytime soon, but, but, that, but that is absolutely the long-term goal, yes. And the other question I had was, um, and you may have said this and I just missed it because I'm tired. No, that's fine. We're all The <laughs> ALK expression. Um, yeah. So what is it exactly about that that determines poor outcome? So we know, um, and I don't see Naveen here because I know he was going to talk about it a little bit tomorrow. Yeah, the, um, in broad strokes, ALK is a protein that goes around turning on other proteins. And by having it there when it shouldn't be on, it's turning on all of those proteins that are proliferating. In normal neuroblast development, normal development of the sympathetic nervous system, it's on early but then it should be shut off. It's on early because you need more of those neuroblast cells to become the, all the different organs. But then once you have the right number, it should be shut off. And in the patients who have it, what we have been able to understand so far is that when ALK is on, more explicitly when it's present, it's on, and then it's going around and it's turning on all those different genes that are making the disease continue to proliferate. When you're assessing the uh, tumors from one child to another, is there a, I understand the correlation from one child to another in terms of what genes are on and off is low, creating a problem. So that's where um, some of the strategy that we take with that is that instead of looking at one particular gene, the body is very redundant. We have backup systems in place. So you may have three or four genes that can do the same type of job and in this patient, gene A may be on, and in this patient, gene B may be on, or C or D. And so instead of looking at just at one, we look at the family. And so instead of looking at just at one gene at a time, sometimes, sometimes you have to look at a group of them. And then you find that there's a correlation, that if any one of the four is on, then, then it's working that way. That's part of the basis for the TLDA. In some of the patients, not all five genes are on necessarily, but four or five are, or three out of five are. And that's enough to say, okay, there's neuroblastoma sitting around. So that's how we try to use our, our law of averages, really, to, to say, okay, here's a common pathway, and that's how we can compare it to all of the patients. But if you, if you have varying genes within that group, mm -hmm. it, doesn't that pose a treatment issue, uh, more difficult in speci uh, being specific? So the, whenever those different genes that have the similar function, they tend to cone down to a common pathway at some point. Um, the, I unfortunately don't have a slide for it, but um, there's, a, there's a whole pathway called um, uh, the PI3K pathway. And at the cell level, they're at the cell membrane level. There's seven different ways to turn that pathway on, but they all cone down to the same two or three genes. So instead of trying to target all the seven ways up here, try to target the thing that's lowered down. That's part of actually what we're doing with the Hox genes, is because the Hox genes are sitting more in the middle there. They, they aren't on the surface. They aren't being activated by things in the environment. And they're not at the very end, because sometimes what happens is that you get to that, that focus point, that node, and then it spreads back out. And sometimes if you look too low, again, if you target this um, effector over here, this thing that's actually doing the work over here, you may miss this one over here that's doing the work. Kind of think of a, like a demolition crew. And if you, uh, if you tell one guy who's on the demolition crew to stop working, the other guys are still working. And it can be hard to get them all to stop at the same time. Instead, if you tell the foreman who's in the middle, that node, tell everyone to stop working, you can shut it all down. So ultimately, you're, you're looking for the, 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 uh, the protein that's mm -hmm. being produced. And, and, and the, in neuroblastoma, how many uh, genes do you think are, are misbehaving or are... Um, <laughs> Uh, that is the, the critical question. Um, uh, frankly, we don't know. Frankly, we... Do you, you have a range? Any idea of how many might be in question? That can, as far... Be... The, there are ones that are... As far as if you... If we went back to that, that microarray and looked at all the different genes that are on or off in the wrong way, we'd be talking about thousands of genes. But they're probably regulated by a smaller number of key genes. Any number I'd give you would be entire speculation and be laughed off by all my colleagues in the back of the room. <laughs> um, but you know, we're probably talking on the, you know, perhaps on the scale of dozens of genes, but a far smaller number. And you don't necessarily have to hit each one. 
these tumors are generally unstable. They're always turning over cells. They're always proliferating. If you can just tip them over and get them unbalanced enough where they say, okay, fine, we give up, that's what our goal is. Thank you very much, Dr. Sure. Okay, one other question. So I'm sorry if you, if you answered this and I no, wasn't that's paying attention. But, um, when you have a hypothesis like this, how do you test it to find out whether, you're, whether it's really true with real patients? Right. And how long does that take, that kind of a study take before it would become mainstream? Sure. So um, how we test it? We test it in lots of different ways. We have these cancer cell lines I, met, I, met, I mentioned. So we have had patients who have been generous enough to, to give us parts of their tumor that we can then expand and grow infinitely. And we can test them directly. So if we have an idea of this gene is important. We can mutate that gene within those cells and turn it off and see what the effect is, or turn it on, or use a treatment and block it. That's the most basic way to test it. And then we build up from there. We have mice that we have, for better or for worse, we've been able to, to make them have neuroblastoma. And so we can test we can take that, that promising treatment and then start treating the mice that have neuroblastoma and say, does that work? And similarly, uh, my, uh, I'm actually um, working with zebrafish. So those tiny little zebrafish that are about this big, we can give them neuroblastoma. And you can test them. And that actually is exceedingly great because instead of having to feed them the drug or inject them the drug, you put it in the water, it gets absorbed. Um, and so you can test that. So we, we start with what we call preclinical tests. We get all the data and all the proof to say, okay, this is probably heading in the right direction. Then we get to clinical studies. And uh, again, my colleagues in the back of the room, particularly Dr. Mathe, can, uh, can talk a lot more about clinical studies. It's a slow process. It's, uh, it's a difficult process. And, and obviously, we like to find a better way to speed it along. Um, sometimes it can take uh, years. Sometimes it can take you know, a decade. Um, the, the work that Dr. Furman will, will talk about a little bit with the uh, um, anti-GD2 antibody. You know, that's been, those have been studies that have been going on for, for a couple decades at this point. But it takes us that long to figure out how to do it right. Because if you go rushing in too quickly, you can do harm. Or if you didn't do it the right way, you may not see the good. And it, it takes tinkering to really get it to work the best. Any other questions? Okay, one more. Pretty simple. Um, my daughter was recently diagnosed in February, but at one, what point during this journey do you test for the ALK mutation? That you have to talk about with your um, individual physician. Um, generally, um, I think most centers we're testing for when we have a concern, either because there's a family history or there's some type of family predisposition to say that this may be an inherited process, um, or if there's a relapse. Um, the studies for treating ALK, and I think someone's going to be talking about that specifically uh, later today as well, um, those, are, uh, those aren't the frontline treatment, and because we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to treat that as well. Yep. Yep. Okay, is that for, is that, um, okay. <laughs> Okay, last question. Um, I think my daughter, um, she, well, she's at Sloan Kennery and they test for the ALK gene as well. Mm -hmm. um, if they tested it after the first, after her resection, mm -hmm. but they found that the, um, that the tumor was apparently completely dead. Okay. So can you still test for the ALK gene when, when it's the, dead? We have, wait, because there was, for that specific test, that's the gene. So that's the DNA, and the DNA is, can be very stable. We have ways in the lab to really test if, um, if it's a, if it's, a, when we do the test, if it's an interpretable test. So there are housekeeping genes, there are different ways that we have checks and balances to make sure that, okay, if the test is saying negative, is that really negative, or is it because just the test didn't work? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So that they have different ways to, to backstop that without really knowing the individual circumstance and how much of the tumor was dead. It, it's hard to say of, um, in individual circumstances, but we have ways to really be able to assess that. And if she does, and if she is positive for the allergy, does that mean that my other daughter is predis predisposed to 
getting neuroblastoma? Isn't because it, isn't it a genetic? Not necessarily. Thing? So with the testing that they would have done to start with would have been in the tumor, uh -huh. and you can have a mutation in the tumor but not in the whole person. So then if you find that the, that the tumor has the mutation, then you can test the patient's blood. So you can test their normal tissues. If their normal tissues don't have the mutation, then it's just a mutation that was just in the tumor and probably doesn't mean that there's a risk for the whole family necessarily. But if, there's a, if the patient in total, their normal cells have that mutation hiding out, then you have to test other family members to say, do they have that mutation as well? So, you would test, so I would test my other daughter for the ALK mutation somehow? The, what I would most recommend is you talk with one of the genetics counselors um, at, at whatever institution you're at for, for all the families. They can kind of talk you through that process, but it's best to do it in a regimented fashion. Start with the tumor, then start with the patient's normal cells, and then go to the family members. Okay, thank you. Okay, is that it? Okay, yep. thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you.